the materials we use for our present um, computing, communications, and information technology are very simple materials. Silicon, gold, aluminum, copper. And we understand how they work very well. We've understood since the 1950s. And in those materials, the electrons are just free to move around like a tenuous gas. When the electrical current passes from one region to the other, all that's happening is a fluid of electrons is flowing smoothly through the material. Now at the beginning of the 21st century, we, st we have started to discover many new electronic materials. And most of them, a big majority of them, have inexplicable properties, completely unexpected properties. For example, high temperature superconductivity in which you can transmit electricity with no loss of power is discovered in this new class of materials. Um, in these materials, we don't understand how the electrons operate. We understand that they are interacting strongly with each other. So instead of being um, a tenuous gas of non-interacting particles, they're much more like a crowd of human beings at a football game or at a dance or something. And as with many complicated problems, it helps tremendously to be able to visualize the thing that you want to understand. But actually, there is no way to visualize electrons moving around in a material. At least that was true until about 10 years ago. At that time, I got an idea for how to develop an instrument which would allow us to visualize, the, no matter how complicated they are, the arrangements and interactions of electrons in these complex new materials. And that machine is called a spectroscopic imaging STM. Um, I built the first one when I was in Berkeley around 1999. Um, it was widely expected to be an expensive failure, <laughs> but in fact it was a great success. It worked as advertised. And then I had the privilege of moving to Cornell, and since we've been here we've built uh, three different ones which have different, different properties, uh, uh, different specifications, so that we can examine different properties of different classes of materials. So here we are, we're uh, in the underground basement laboratory space uh, in Clark Hall um, on the Cornell campus. This is where most of the experimental physics is done uh, in this university. And here I'm standing outside uh, one of our uh, very specialized uh, scanning tunneling microscopes. I'm going to refer to it as an STM from now on. It's got a very special environment, um, a chamber uh, which is somewhat like a recording studio which prevents acoustic and electromagnetic noise from getting into the experimental chamber. One other thing we must do before the measurements is that this whole room is, um, must be floated on cushions of air in order to, vib to vibrationally isolate it from the outside world. So we lift up this 35 ton block of concrete with the experimental apparatus and its room on top by about a quarter of an inch and then it sits there um, in an extremely vibrationally quiet uh, situation. So inside the chamber uh, we have a second layer, this large blue triangular table is a second layer of vibrational isolation. Um, it looks reasonably light and airy, but it's actually filled with lead shot and it weighs about five tons. And when it's in operation, the motions of this large object are no more than the diameter of an atom. Um, and then this uh, vertical cylinder you see here is a very large thermos bottle and it's full of liquid helium-4 at a temperature of minus 269 degrees uh, below the freezing temperature of water or just about four degrees above the absolute zero of temperature. It's one of the coldest places in the universe. In fact, however, inside there is a refrigerator called a dilution refrigerator, which cools down the experiment by almost to absolute zero. And then right down here at this level, inside the center of this cylinder, is a little uh, device called a spectroscopic imaging scanning tunneling microscope. It's about two inches high and two inches in diameter, and it contains the technology to image the electronic wave functions of the electrons that we study in this apparatus. If you think back to how a phonograph worked, uh, the old machine for playing music on, uh, on an LP, you had a, a plastic disc, 
and there are little grooves and with wiggles in them on that disc. You take a sharp needle and you put it down. The disc is moving and the needle conforms to the wiggles on the disc and sends a signal to an audio amplifier and that's the music that you hear. Now imagine taking that device and shrinking it down, say, by a million times so that you have little features on the surface of a material, but each feature is an atom. And you have a very fine needle which has one atom on the end of the needle. And now you raster that needle back and forth over the surface and by measuring the, the electrical current from the end of the needle to the surface, you can actually take an image of where the atoms were in the surface, are in the surface. That was invented around 1982 by Binig and Rohrer in IBM in Zurich and they got the Nobel Prize for inventing that machine uh, quite soon thereafter because it was revolutionary. You can see where the atoms are in materials. The challenge that I faced was everyone could see where the atoms were but nobody could see where the electrons were. So I had to find a scheme where using the same rastering of the tip over the surface but measuring a different thing, I, I would, based on a theoretical argument, come up with an image, a movie actually, of electronic wave functions they're called because electrons are actually quantum mechanical waves and how they move through the material and how they interact with each other. And that scheme involved just measuring a different, uh, different property of the electrical current going from the end of the needle to the surface and then measuring it under conditions which were really quite different than which are used in a commercial STM. Namely, the vibrational and the acoustic noise levels have to be about a million times better for my scheme to work. One thing which we would really, really like to do is to cut short the so-called virtuous cycle for discovering new materials. The traditional way is you have some genius chemist or physical chemist. They put in a whole bunch of different element, elements. They cook it up. They take out some new material and then they measure, you measure its properties. My gosh, it's a magnet. Amazing, it's a superconductor. Astonishing, it's a semiconductor, okay? And then you, you try to figure out, well, why is it that it has the properties that it had? And if, if we, and we know the answer to that for materials like silicon and gold and aluminum and platinum and things like that. But we don't know the answer to that for tailor-made and exotic materials which are being developed for 21st century technology and the process is slow. Someone makes a new material, then you have to do all kinds of measurements which may take years and years and then you have to cook up a theory to explain the suite of the results of the different measurements and then you would use that theory to help you uh, figure out how to improve the material or to get an even better one. But you'd like to cut short that process so that it only takes a few days rather than a few years. So we imagine with our technique, a uh, new material would be fabricated, let's say by one of our colleagues here um, at Cornell University, Daryl Schlom is world famous for developing new materials which haven't existed in nature before. But instead of spending years and years doing measurements, you would take that material and put it in a spectroscopic STM and you would just image the way the electronic structure is working, what the electrons are doing, how they're interacting with each other, and how they're producing the properties of the material. With our present generation machines, you could do that in about 12 hours. So you could go home at night, and in the next morning, you could have cut short that cycle of many years to figure out the electronic structure, so that you know this is why the material has the properties it has. Then you go to your fabrication, your colleague, and say, we, we've, we, we understand why it has these weird properties and if you just tweak this component of your fabrication of the material we would predict that you would get this important and exotic new property. Then if they're working hard maybe they could do that in a few days or a few weeks. So the virtuous cycle for finding and making uh, uh, unimaginable new materials could be altered by this approach.